Welcome to MuggleCast episode 405. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm uh, Micah. And I'm Laura. On today's show, we're going to be talking about Half-Blood Prince, chapter by chapter. We're going to go into chapter 17, A Sluggish Memory. And we have a lot of news to discuss today as well. It's funny. It just ebbs and flows. Like, one week we have zero news at all. The next week there's, like, four interesting stories to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, you're back. That's our biggest news, though. Yes, and thank you for making the 404 joke. I appreciate it. It was very well done. I wish I had thought of it. Uh, I think we just made up the news last week. Is that <laughs> accurate? Like, why isn't J.K. Rowling tweeting? Uh, well, uh. like, you guys should have entered that differently. You should have said the news is that there's no news. There's no J.K. Rowling. What's going on? Mm, now, let's yeah. just... Yeah. Let's just bring that up now. We are now on day 28 of no JK Rowling on Twitter. I'm starting to get heart palpitations and headaches. Hashtag Rowling Watch. I'm not feeling well. I need her back on social media. <laughs> I think that we could just come up with something really ridiculous that she's revealed about the wizarding <laughs> world. Like, I don't know, wizards crapping themselves <laughs> and disappearing their poop. <laughs> We made the J.K. <laughs> Rowling tweets since you all missed them. Um, I do like kind of like the theory that she's <laughs> annoyed with what's going on with Fantastic Beasts. Maybe WB annoyed her and she just decided to leave Twitter because I looked it up. The uh, She left Twitter six days before the news broke that mm. they were delaying the start of Fantastic Beasts. So maybe she found out around that time, and then it took the media a few days later uh, to catch on. But yeah, or you know, she's just on vacation, or she's just on a social media break. I, I just I said this last week, but I just would have expected an announcement of some sort. Like <laughs> it doesn't need to be high stakes. It could just be like, "Hey, folks, I'm getting off here for a little bit." You know. Um, yeah, sometimes people do that. It's kind of cool to say you're leaving social media these days. Right? I know I do it. Right around yeah. Christmas. Mm -hmm. I'm leaving, everybody. Goodbye. Good day. <laughs> well, we will keep everybody posted. I think Trump reported her. <laughs> Trump reported her. You know, we got a review uh, recently, Micah, saying, stop bringing up Trump. A Republican asked yeah. that. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I did not realize that Paul Manafort listened to this show. That's so cute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right so let's talk about some real news now um harry potter and the cursed child is opening in san francisco this october and tickets are going to be on sale in march and if you are planning on trying to get a ticket it's probably going to be very difficult because for a lot of people in america this is their first time they're going to be able to see the show mm -hmm. um you can sign up for early registration that is open now to get access to, quote, priority access, whatever that means. I don't know if this is like a verified fan thing like Ticketmaster did in the U.S. Or sorry, in uh, New York. But um, hmm. yeah, if, if you're looking to get tickets for Cursed Child in San Francisco, then hit that link. Hmm. Go to the Cursed Child's website. A little bit of gossip to talk about this week. I love some gossip. Who doesn't love some gossip? Um I think we brought up on a previous installment of Bonus MuggleCast that Universal is building a new theme park. They're planning on building a new theme park. And they've been planning on calling it Fantastic Worlds. And in the Bonus MuggleCast, we were talking about, isn't that really close to Fantastic Beasts? Like, why are they calling it Fantastic Worlds? That's, that's kind of surprising. Mm. Well, Warner Brothers is surprised as well. They have now filed two requests for an extension of time to oppose this trademark. Hmm. <laughs> so Universal has not been approved for the Fantastic Worlds trademark yet because WB is saying, hold up. I think this violates one of our trademarks. Um, and presumably, Warner Brothers isn't cool with it because... They think it's too close to Fantastic Beasts, their current franchise. Yeah. Do you guys agree? Is it too close of a name to Fantastic Beasts? I mean, no. I don't. I don't know that anybody can claim to have a trademark on the word fantastic. No. 
But the, I think the concern is people are going to be looking at this Fantastic Worlds theme park. This is going to be an entire theme park, not just a land, and thinking it's Harry Potter related. I mean, maybe if they were going to call it Fantastic Busts. Busts? Busts. B-U-S-T-S. Why would they call it that? Never mind. The joke <laughs> okay. sailed <laughs> did not, way did over. Did not land. Yeah, I'm lost. <laughs> it did not land. All right. Well, I, I don't know. I I seem to care about this way more than you guys do. I I think it's uh pretty dramatic that Warner Brothers is holding them up, mm -hmm. especially because Warner Brothers and Universal have a cozy relationship thanks to the Wizarding World of Harry Potter lands. It's just so I I I read that this is confirmed that if they did go forward with Fantastic Worlds that they would have a Harry Potter so like a new dedicated Harry Potter section. Yeah, and I, I presume that this would be where they put a Fantastic Beasts land. Mm. They got to do that now, right? They can't do another Harry Potter one without doing Fantastic Beasts. I'm surprised they haven't already in the normal park, so that's kind of my hesitation. But yeah, I, I, I don't know, because it seems like this new Fantastic Worlds, they have a dedicated uh, set of other areas that would not be Harry Potter. I wonder if it wouldn't be more realistic to just let islands of adventure slowly become <laughs> harry potter like the one harry potter theme park and then have fantastic worlds be some of the other properties yeah i don't know it just harry potter has overtaken both of the parks that it already is in um yeah well they want to create another park because then people will stay longer mm -hmm. at the universal hotels and just more money there um apparently fantastic worlds is going to be where the Nintendo Land is going to be mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. which I'm very excited for. Man. Anyway, yeah. that's what's going the on there. The only thing that I can think of is maybe they don't want to create confusion if Fantastic right. Beasts is going to be a part of this particular park. Then does that tie it into the other things that are in it, like Nintendo? And that 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 would probably be the only thing that I can think of, but. Why not just, yeah. to the point that was raised, expand the Wizarding World mm -hmm. more and don't even worry about what they're creating well, I, in the other part of their park? Yeah. It'd be crazy if like they like extended the train or something so that it went to that third land. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> and we have be crazy. Crazy. Maybe they can just come up with a different name that's more in keeping. Like, why don't they call it Adventure Worlds? Like Islands of Adventure, Adventure Worlds go. can be the other one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. More Universal, Universal more. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely Universal more. Uh, yeah, apart from not necessarily owning like the trademark for the word fantastic, it is a branding concern. It is a question of break. Is like yeah. Fantastic Beasts is one of the only properties using that word now, so you just kind of assume that it's connected. Exactly. That that's why I'm so shocked by this. A that Universal um, would do this, and B that WB actually is concerned mm. as well. Mm. I mean, there's there's something there if they're concerned. I imagine they're doing some research or something. Maybe some uh, what's that called when you uh, when you uh, do surveys with people? Maybe they're doing surveys to figure out if people get confused by market this. research surveys that kind of thing. market. Right. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of the park, though, how close are we to? The new ride opening. I don't know. They haven't announced a date, but uh, they're still building. It's going to be this year. We just don't know yeah. when this year. They're also building an entire new hotel called Endless Summer. So I think they're going to try to open those up around the same time. God, that makes like nine hotels. And they've they've built five of the la The last five of them were built like without any significant upgrades to the park. So I'm yeah, I'm blown away. I'm well, it's all thanks to Harry Potter. People are turning out big time thanks to those two lands yeah gosh laura i know that you and i have had a smashing time at the original land but have you been to diagon alley oh yeah you love it oh yeah it's amazing sorry i just got a frog in my throat <laughs> um <clears throat> a chocolate frog <laughs> yeah um no i loved it i got to go a few years ago i think it was amazing okay. like cool. i don't know i just i don't know which one i like better yeah yeah, it is tough, isn't it? They're both yeah. really fantastic. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> uh... Um. All right. So, Eric, you brought up uh, Larry Poppins in Lego Movie Two <laughs> last week, and now you've seen it. Yeah. So I've seen Lego Movie Two. Uh, we mentioned last week Dan Radcliffe was uh, either scheduled to or did a cameo in the uh, Lego Movie Two that was cut. 
And his character, he was going to play a knockoff Harry Potter called Larry Potter, was replaced by a Mary Poppins knockoff, Larry Poppins. And I got to say, the cameo is actually like the first one in the film where it's like a cutaway joke. So it happens quite early on in the movie. And, you know, Larry Poppins, it's fine, but it's a cameo. Now that I've seen it, I know that, you know, the question was um, the director had said that they pulled the Dan Radcliffe cameo because it would upset Harry Potter fans. And I have to say, having seen this cameo, that it was uh, completely innocuous. It was zero stakes. (laughs) You know, there was no reason why it couldn't have been Larry Potter, although... I would have been upset because Larry Poppins does not come back at all the rest of the film. So if if they were going to, you know, have Dan Radcliffe on board, I would have liked to have seen him in more of a substantial role. But I really don't think anybody would have been offended if it had just been Larry Potter. But isn't that what a cameo is? It's just like a yeah. quick appearance. Blinking. You yeah. It. yeah. Eric wants his money back. Yeah. It sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> on to a little Fantastic Beast news. Uh, Crimes of Grindelwald is out digitally next weekend. It comes out February 15th. We're going to be off next week because a couple of us have other things going on. Um, But in two weeks, I think we will host a discussion on things that we notice while watching it at home, which will be fine because we'll be able to pause it and maybe look at some details that we didn't notice in the theater. Mm -hmm. So I'm really looking forward to that. Again, Crimes of Grindelwald will be out digitally February 15th. And then next month... In March, it'll be out for on uh, DVD and Blu-ray, and that's when we're going to get the extended edition with the deleted scenes. So we have to wait a little bit longer for those. But in the meantime, I'm excited to see the movie at home. Yeah. And one more news story. Dan Fogler spoke to a website called HeyYouGuys.com. <laughs> He'll apparently talk to anybody. (laughs) Except us. (laughs) Never heard of this website before. Hey, you guys. Um, And he was talking about a bunch of different things, but they asked him about the Fantastic Beasts production delay. And he said it's been delayed because the movie is, quote, gigantic. The reason we were given is that the movie is bigger than the first two combined they needed more time to prep, and they didn't want to rush anything, so they pushed it back. <sighs> Dan also said they are going to Brazil in the movie, which J.K. Rowling has been hinting at, but never confirmed. And, uh, yeah, so we know for sure they're going to Brazil. I was surprised that Dan F- Fogler would say, after the reception to movie two, that it's bigger than the first two combined. That scares me a little bit. Mm-hmm. yeah not really what i wanted to hear <laughs> yeah i want to hear like we're getting back to basics like the first movie <laughs> yeah a, a bigger film is and, and you mentioned this in your article on hypable andrew I, I couldn't agree more what this series needs is is a smaller film not a bigger film you know more, more of a, a slow boil because they're at serious risk of isolating even their most hardcore fans by creating films that are so bombastic they're so confusing and don't make any sense whatsoever Mm -hmm. but bigger in what sense that's the question is it just that is the question bigger in terms of geographic location we're going from the uk to brazil to france to new york or bigger in terms of action and storylines and maybe dan just had to be very very careful with the words that he used given that they haven't even started filming yet He hasn't even read the script. He hasn't seen the script. So I wonder how he could say that it's bigger. But like you said, Andrew, like that's what they told the actors of, hey, it's going to be bigger. So if that is what they said, then that's a question as far as Warner Brothers. But I mean, delayed production affects everybody's schedule. You know, these actors are fairly busy. Surely they have other projects they're working on. You know, it's it's very interesting to get any sort of notice from Warner Brothers that – seems to justify it in such a an unwanted way (laughs) Mm. well i think it's pr spin Mm. i think this is the line that the act that they want the actors to say when they are asked about this in interviews for other projects because like you say they are out there doing other things right now Mm -hmm. and naturally this is going to come up um but realistically 
you know, I, I was tweeting about this and some people were pushing back being like, well, what does bigger actually mean? Is this actually enough time to adjust the script? I think I have no information to back this up, but I think they are just working on improving the script, not that they need more prep time because it's bigger. And to Micah's point about, well, if we're also going to Brazil, that means we have to build a whole new world. And that's going to take a, I don't mean like with special effects. I mean, in the script, you have to build a whole new world and that's going to take some time to introduce us to the various things that we've never seen before um, concerning the, the wizarding community in Brazil. Mm -hmm. So I just hope that they're trimming everything down, maybe cutting out a couple of characters. When I watch the digital release of Crimes of Grindelwald, I'm going to be making a list of things that I think were wholly unnecessary <laughs> that I think that they can just forget about for movie three. Right. And we talked a lot about the wizarding school in Brazil and the fact that one of the subjects that it's well known for is alchemy. So I think that the story obviously is going to continue around that, given that they introduced Flamel uh, in the last film, in The Sorcerer's Stone, we saw that. But to your point, world building is challenging, and I think we've already been thrown in so many different directions with the way that Crimes and Grindelwald was written that for it to get bigger going into movie three, that's a little bit scary. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, we'll see, and maybe watching it digitally will change our opinions. I know watching the movie in the theater a second time, I felt better about it, so... Yeah, I did too. Yeah. When I'm at home, cuddling with my dog, got my feet kicked up, maybe I'll feel even better about the movie. Yeah, and then you can pause it at those moments where you're like, what the heck? <laughs> and just really think about it for a minute. <laughs> yeah. I have my script book. I still have it right here. I can follow along. It's so exciting. <laughs> I want to give a shout out to our latest patrons, Colin Creevy. Believe it or not, Colin oh. Creevy signed up. Hannah Hobson, Cody Hickman, Igna Palmquist, Molly M, Kathy Gollin, Denise, Katie, Mark, Catherine, Corey, Lisa, Janira, Nick, Andrea, Victoria, Sarah, Jasmine, Kamira, Rosalie, Katie. Thank you to everybody who has recently become a patron over at patreon.com slash mugglecast. They're getting benefits like bonus mugglecast ad-free MuggleCast, access to our recording studio. We are recording live on the internet on uh, this Saturday morning. Mm. We also have an exclusive Facebook group. You'll get a physical gift every year. There's lots of benefits over at patreon.com slash MuggleCast. And I also want to give a shout out to people who've recently reviewed us on iTunes. Kim, who said there's one major problem with the show. We aren't Muggles, you guys. We are. <laughs> no yeah wink wink <laughs> <laughs> what if laura this whole time has actually been a wizard that'd be so crazy oh, man mm -hmm. the boss man also reviewed us and said we need to cool it with our political opinions because harry potter is for conservatives too um okay um hang on a yeah, second who wants to take I just, this hold hold all my three of us yes, right <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have okay. no problem with that feedback. No, me neither. But I want to bring up the point that at least during my very short tenure, having returned to the show, um, most of the political sort of commentary and allegories that have come up have been in relation to Donald Trump. Donald Trump is not a conservative. <laughs> he's He's not. So nobody here is complaining about people who are like genuine conservatives. Mm. Um, this guy is not one. <laughs> He's an aspiring autocrat. Mm -hmm. So that is why he continues to come up again and again. That's such a Democrat opinion. That's such a liberal opinion, Laura, of, of, of Donald Trump, honestly. Well... Uh, I think some Republicans would say he's... Uh... Yeah, they're starting to fold on him, too. Yeah. I mean, I, no, I'm just saying, I, I, you know, this whole Harry Potter is for conservatives, too. I would like to think there are conservatives out there who are quite afraid of this uh, uh, dystopian, uh, <laughs> totalitarian regime he's building mm -hmm. um, as well. It's It's not a bipartisan, you know, effort should be to get this guy out. Because the points we brought up last week 
are happening, whether you like it or not. There's no there's no political spin. You know, the the facts are the facts. These the, these are things that are happening. Yeah, we're like we're like um, CNN. We're real news. <laughs> God, <laughs> real Harry Potter news. And uh, I just want to also give a shout out to Bucks fan three, Alex, Ra, Jake, Cullen, and this is Meg. I just want to say thank you for reviewing us on iTunes because it helps us get noticed. So if you could take a moment to review us on iTunes, if you haven't already, we would really appreciate that. And we promise this podcast is for everybody. Yeah, it is. And and I'm not surprised by the the feedback, but I would agree with what Laura said in terms of our discussion. We're having pretty in-depth discussion last week about the ministry and about government. And I think that if you want to cast all you know political beliefs aside it's only natural to tie this discussion to current political you know or current politicians right i mean mm-hmm. when when joe wrote the the other minister chapter she definitely had certain people in mind she definitely had the person that the other, the Muggle Prime Minister was supposed to speak to on the phone, be a president that was in power at the time. And I think there are comparisons to be made between the Prime Minister um, and and the Muggle Prime Minister. I should say the Prime Minister at the time and, and, and the Muggle Prime Minister. So yeah. mm-hmm. it, it, everybody's entitled to their opinion and everybody's entitled to their belief. Um, and you know we we certainly don't want to deter anyone from listening to the show, but I feel like given these chapters and how integral the ministry is in the daily affairs of the main characters, it's natural that you're going to get comparisons to present day government to other governments that existed uh, previously. We've talked a lot about World War II, so I just think that uh, we'll be we'll be a little bit more mindful, but but know that. I think the comparisons are are warranted. Yeah, I wasn't uh, reading that review to uh, you know have us lecture anybody or anything. I wasn't lecturing you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew's like, shut up. No, I mean, so one thing that I will bring up too is that a you know sort of a, a really big theme in the Potter books is people who are in positions of authority mm-hmm. and abuse that power. <clears throat> Excuse me, I can't get this thing out of my throat. Um, Expulso. I, I'm a witch, right? I should be able to do that. Um, so, but I mean, you look at situations like all the drama that's going on in the Virginia governor's mansion mm-hmm. right now. Like, there are clearly people, no matter the affiliation, that can end up in positions of power who should not be there. Mm-hmm. So, this isn't a case of being partisan it's just a case of identifying a particular individual who is reflective of certain themes that we see in the potter books and and sort of drawing those connections yes i will say generally one reason i enjoy doing chapter by chapter these days is because we can look at these chapters and apply what is going on in them to our own lives whether it's politically personal or personally um, it's like it's like I enjoy reading into song lyrics because you can apply those lyrics often to your own life. It's the same thing that's happening with uh, chapter by chapter. All right, and we are about to get to chapter by chapter and some voicemails. But first, our first sponsor this week is Care of. I love this company. We all love this company. They're a monthly subscription vitamin service that delivers completely personalized vitamin and supplement packs right to your door. Did you know? That 90% of people fall short of FDA-recommended guidelines for at least one vitamin or nutrient? Care of makes sure you're getting the vitamins and supplements you need to lead a better life. You start by taking their online quiz that asks you about your diet, your health goals, and lifestyle. And after they have your answers, they give you a personalized list of vitamins and supplements that you should be taking. Then you order them from Care of, and they'll start delivering them right to your door. I took the quiz. It was fun and easy. They gave me six types of vitamins they think I need. And Care of provides all the research that supports each of their recommendations. And it's all backed by a scientific advisory board. So their decisions can be trusted. Your vitamins get delivered right to your door in personalized, easy-to-remember daily packs. You just pull a pill pack out of the box every day. 
It's got your name and a fun fact or challenge for your daily amusement printed right on the pack. And now every day, I'm taking six pills that'll do things like improve my energy, give me fish oils, and give me precious vitamin D because Karev realized uh, he doesn't get out enough. (laughs) These were all things that Karev decided I needed after I told them about my lifestyle and their quiz. I'm really enjoying it. And as someone who works out and already tries to eat healthy, I love knowing that my workouts and diet are now being complemented with the nutrients I've been missing. I want you to try care of. You're going to love having your daily vitamins and supplements figured out by the experts. Take advantage of this month's special New Year offer for 50% off your first month of personalized care of vitamins. Go to takecareof.com and enter MuggleCast50. You may notice that our last care of deal wasn't as good as this one. This one's double the discount. Takecareof.com and enter code MuggleCast50 for 50% off your first month. Uh, I was just talking with the guys about uh, the our respective pill packs because we're all taking them right now, aren't we? Yep. Fish burps. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've already noticed uh, a lot of um, more of a, a presence of mind. Like I feel more awake, more aware rather. Oh, good. Yeah. You're probably missing some, some nutrients yeah. <laughs> and care of notice yeah. in the quiz. <laughs> oh, I definitely was. <laughs> definitely was. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's listen to some voicemails before we get to chapter by chapter. First, we have a correction. Hey, Michael Cass. This is Rebecca. I've been listening to your show since the very beginning. Love you guys so much. But in your recent chapter by chapter, A Very Frosty Christmas, um, I think it was mentioned that Bill got mauled by Grayback in Order of the Phoenix. That's actually incorrect. He got mauled by Greyback at the end of this book, The Half-Blood Prince. So he doesn't even have any of those wolfish tendencies until the end of this book. And also the altercation between Mrs. Weasley and Fleur doesn't happen until the end of this book. So they don't have their moment yet, and that's why they still aren't on speaking terms. And also Bill and Fleur just got engaged at the very beginning of this book. So they haven't been spending that much time together with the Weasleys. So there's also that. But other than that, thank you guys so much. You do a great job. I love listening to you. Bye. Yep. Uh, If I had been here, that wouldn't have happened. (laughs) (laughs) That was me, by the way. Sorry, guys. Okay, Laurie. No, we, we, we went along with it, though, so we're just as culpable. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) You've brought shame upon us all, Laura. I know. I'll be honest. I mean, you know, there's a lot of information that we have to remember, of course, and quite frequently during our discussions, I'm sitting here Googling to make sure that <laughs> we're about to say something that's correct. It is hard, though, because you spend so much time with the books initially, but then if you don't reread them regularly, what ends up happening is you tend to rely a lot on the movies because yes, you see them a lot more. They're on television. Maybe you you watch them in your free time. So, um, but maybe you have more of a visual memory too. I know that's mm-hmm. the case with mm-hmm. me. That's a great point. Um, but like speaking of just forgetting, like when I was reading last week's chapter in preparation for today, I had forgotten how vicious Grayback is. Yeah. Cause it, cause in the movie he, he doesn't, he's seriously reduced. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And he's yeah. Al- almost kind of like comical. Yeah. In some ways, like I recently rewatched Deathly Hallows part one Mm -hmm. and there was the part where the Snatchers caught the trio and Harry's face was all swollen and puffy. And one of the Snatchers was like, what happened to you, ugly? And then Greyback kind of looks at him weird. And then he looks at Greyback and he's like, not you. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, no, he's actually way more terrifying than that. (laughs) All right, here is our next voicemail. Hey, MuggleCast, this is Katie from Texas. I was just listening to your last episode where you were talking about Harry and Lupin's conversation at Christmas, and I thought it was really unfair for Lupin to say that Harry had um, inherited Sirius and James's prejudices because before Harry ever met Lupin, before he knew anything about their father's rivalry, he already did not like Snape because of the way Snape treated him and his friends. And, you know, what kid wouldn't feel the way Harry feels about Snape 
after the way Snape treated him and after the way Snape treats Neville. And uh, so I think, if anything, Harry has inherited Snape's old grudges. And I just thought that that was a really unfair thing for Lupin to say and that it, it shows that he doesn't really understand just how, you know, unfair Snape is to the kids. And um just curious to see what you guys think about that. Thanks for the show. I really enjoy listening to it every week. Keep up the good work, guys. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree with that. It almost seems like a mistake from J.K. Rowling. <laughs> like, why would Lupin think that Harry's inheriting Sirius and James's issues? I mean, it, it could just be Lupin trying to separate these two things, right? Just because Snape is a mean teacher does not mean that he's working for Voldemort. Yeah. So it could be he's trying to drive that home and he's trying to make Harry see like, hey, just because this guy's an ass doesn't mean that he's working for Lord Voldemort. Mm -hmm. Even though he is. Yeah, it's almost... (laughs) Kind of. You take it at the literal sense of the word inherited... But I think that it's a great point. Harry definitely develops his own feelings towards Snape way before Lupin ever is in the picture and learns about his father, learns about Sirius. And uh, I think it says more about Snape than it really does about Harry. Uh, they've they've never seen eye to eye from, from day one, really. And I don't think that Snape, you know, if Lupin was having that same conversation with Neville, with Seamus, with any of the other Gryffindors or Hufflepuffs or Slyther or Ravenclaws, I should say. I mean, it seems like he's a fan favorite amongst the Slytherins, but I don't think he has that great reputation. I don't I think any student has really a, sort of that negative perception of Snape and doesn't really like him at all. Yeah. yeah. Snape definitely earns his reputation or Harry's dislike of him. But I, I think what Lupin's trying to get at, too, is like ever since Harry did find out that Snape was awful to his parents, too, he's gotten more of a reason to hate Snape or suspect of wrongdoing. Like, I think maybe Lupin's uh, a f- having a failed attempt to, you know, reduce the unnecessary just just to make sure that Harry is, you know, has a good reason yeah. for what he's doing. And there's James yeah. needed none. There are moments when. You know, Harry doesn't know a whole hell of a lot about his his father, and I'm um, again going to the movies here. But there's there's a line where Snape says to Harry, "Your father was a swine," <laughs> and you know this is a fifteen sixteen year old kid who doesn't still really know that much about his parents. I mean, he's heard about them from other people, but to to hear that at that age from somebody who's supposed to be your your professor who's mm-hmm. supposed to be teaching you and instilling like values in you and helping you grow as an individual right that's horrible all right another voicemail in regards to last week hi muggle cast this is jacob from virginia um i want to talk briefly about the mrs weasley flirt relationship um because i think i think jk rowling does hit on what Laura was bringing up, uh, that this mother-in-law tension story is pretty tried and true. Um, I grew up with a sort of Mrs. Weasley figure in my neighborhood, and she, I, I think, um, I think the tension in Mrs. Weasley and Fleur's relationship becomes from a perceived different set of values on Mrs. Weasley's part. She thinks that Fleur maybe doesn't like their disheveled home or their, like there's a, there's a different set of reasons that she likes Phil as is portrayed in, it was actually the end of Half-Blood Prince when she thinks that um, Fleur won't like Phil anymore because he's, he's not handsome or what have you. So it's, it's a total lack of understanding of Fleur's motivation um, based on, I don't know, perceived prejudice of the French, of blonde girls. I don't know. Um, anyway, so I think that's, that's what plays out. Um, anyway, really enjoy the show. Thanks. Bye. Mm-hmm. I like that. Yeah, I mean, also, Floor is part Vila, so I'm sure mm-hmm. there's some prejudice going on there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've definitely talked, uh, even last week, about how the Weasleys 
uh, compass or the Weasley family's, you know, how they manage certain uh, ideas about other races could be fraught, could be a problem. So I, I found that to be a very illuminating discussion last week. And one more voicemail regarding Fantastic Beasts. Hey, Muggle Cast, Claire, I called. Um, I got cut off, but um, I was talking about um, Draco. Um, you were talking about him recently and his unbreakable vow. Um, do you think potentially with use of comma and different things coming up that we might see what happens when an unbreakable vow is broken? Um, we're talking about Draco and Snape and different things like that. We haven't really seen the effects of what happens when an unbreakable vow is broken. What happens? What are the consequences? Is it death or what, what happens or what does that death look like? We haven't seen that yet. So that was just my, you know, food for thought. Um, do you think we might see that in a film at some point? Um, and, you know, if that's going to come up within these next five movies, um, we have, we didn't see them in the first seven, but we've heard about them so much and, we haven't really gotten like a solid thing of what happens when it's broken. We've just seen them fulfilled. Um, let me know what your thoughts are. Um, I will keep listening. Bye. I would love to see what happens when you violate an unbreakable vow, but I think J.K. Rowling might focus us on the blood pact that was made between Dumbledore and Grindelwald because. Of course, that was very prominent in Crimes of Grindelwald, and Dumbledore might be trying to destroy it within the next three movies. Yeah, and uh, I, you know, I'd love to see what would, would I'd love to see how it would kill you if you broke an Unbreakable Vow, but we can't use the use of comma Unbreakable Vow because it's so damn vague. Um, <laughs> well, we could be learning more about it. I mean, they're not really like for for the whole like you have to avenge the people that your father would have hated or something, something, something. I'm just like, well, we've questioned openly and Micah, especially, you know, you can back me up, like why this unbreakable vow is supposedly still in effect, too. So it just would be really unclear and it would be a crappy way for use of comma to go out of like, oops, I uh accidentally forgot to kill this person who is technically blood related but nobody knows he's blood related and now that person has gone on to like survive like a weird thing would just like randomly kill him in an important scene when he's about to divulge like super important info like oops broke my unbreakable vow it's just that i don't i have no faith that they could use like use of some breakable vow in a in a cool way to like show him succumb mm. That would be my question is, is the unbreakable vow still valid? Because supposedly Corvus Jr. is dead. He died in the middle of the sea during the you know Titanic-like uh, incident <laughs> that occurred in Crimes of Grindelwald. So technically, Yusuf should be absolved of his responsibility to carry out that task. I would also ask, who did he make the unbreakable vow with? Did he make it with his father? That seems like the most likely person. But also, could you be absolved of an unbreakable vow? Let's say that, for the sake of argument, Credence is actually Corvus. Could Credence kind of allow Yusuf to somehow not have to carry out uh, the act that he was tasked with? I. I think it would be cool, definitely, to the point of this voicemail, to just learn more about Unbreakable Vows. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I guess, yes, in the name, it kind of says you can't break it, but there has to be some way around it, kind of similar to the Blood Pact, Andrew, where uh, Dumbledore thinks there might be a way that he can maybe dissolve the Blood Pact or, or you know, so I, I think there's more to be seen here and, and more to learn. Yeah, and like what happens when you violate it? I want to see what happens. So you just... It's like a death drop. You just drop to the ground. You're dead. Do you dissolve? Do you float up in the air and then explode? What happens? <laughs> he violated it. Screams like a, something screams like a howler, and then you die. All right, a couple of emails, then we'll get to chapter by chapter. Eric, do you want to read them? Sure. Uh, this one comes from Sherry. She wrote in to say, hey, everyone, I have some thoughts on Molly, Lupin, and the weirdness of the adults constantly talking about trusting Dumbledore. 
I agree completely that Molly is rude and unkind to Fleur in this chapter, but this is by no means the first time we've seen this behavior from her. In Order of the Phoenix, she was incredibly disgustingly rude to Sirius and in his own home. It always bothers me that nobody ever talks about this. I was glad to hear you talk about this aspect of her personality. The garden gnome thing bothered me too. I admit to laughing over Dudley's pig tail, the ton-tongue toffee, and the amazing bouncing ferret, but the gnome bothered me even on my first read of the book. I think one reason I've cut Ron a lot of slack over his prejudices is that he learned them at home. And, to be fair, so did Draco Malfoy. But Ron at least changed his mind quickly about werewolves and didn't have an issue with Hagrid being a half-giant. Harry was bullied by Snape before he knew how serious and James felt about him. I think... Harry can form his own feelings about why Snape is such a jerk. I don't agree that he was, quote, working on the side of the light all those years. In one sense, sure he was, but he was doing it for Lily. We don't know what his true thoughts were about Voldemort or Dumbledore and what either of them stood for. The good guys in the Potter series always scared me a little with their utter devotion to Dumbledore, and this should probably come up later in this book study. But doesn't it bother anyone that Dumbledore and Snape knew Draco's mission and just let him run free in a school of children? Katie and Ron both could have died due to their negligence. It's shocking to me. But if I had been a parent of a wizarding child and happened to hear what was going on, I'd pull my kid out of that crazy place so fast. Thanks again for all the great discussion. Cherry. Yeah, I mean, I bring this up from time to time on the show. Hogwarts is a very dangerous place for children. And it's really irresponsible of Dumbledore. And here he goes again. <laughs> I mean, there's this kid on a murder mission running around the school com completely free to do whatever he wants. Yeah. And, uh, and, and we'll talk about it in this chapter, too. Yeah. But Dumbledore is totally aware. Yeah. Dumbledore 100% knows and is letting this happen. And to the point of, uh, you know, we were just talking about what happens when you break an unbreakable vow like we didn't find out in the books because dumbledore and snape decided to go with it they were they were like oh draco's got to kill me or it's got to be you sure we'll work with right <laughs> i'm i'm cursed anyway exactly so very interesting stuff and uh we do appreciate uh, all of our listeners who write in love reading emails so let's jump into chapter by chapter this week we're discussing chapter 17 of half-blood prince a sluggish memory We'll start, as always, with our seven-word summary. Uh, um, That's a hell of a word. I'm, I'm thinking oh. out loud. I'm so glad I don't have to go first this week. <laughs> yeah, I signed myself up to go first. What was I thinking? <laughs> um, young. Wizards. <laughs> <laughs> can make horcruxes from <laughs> <laughs> this is so bad <laughs> murders okay, okay not that bad but this is see when i started when i said young i was hoping you guys were going to go for like tom riddle yeah but i also the this is not the chapter where we learn what horcruxes are so <laughs> We just did the seven word summary from yeah. somewhere else in the books. Mm. Well, but we get them. So yeah. we, we get tastes of them. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, so I just wanted to bring up something that's not very important right at the beginning. Uh, the fat lady has made the password to the Gryffindor common room abstinence. <laughs> <laughs> what is she trying to say? I thought that it was in reference to her being super hungover yeah. from her, you know, partying. Abstinence from alcohol. Yeah. She was getting lit during Christmas. <laughs> yeah, 500 year old <laughs> wine. But there's so much romance in, in these books that I thought maybe she was trying to say, you know, abstain from. Keep it in the pants. Uh, sex, sexual yeah. relations. Yeah, I mean, it, it could definitely be have some double meaning here. Does the fat lady need to lecture the kids on what, what to do in school time? <laughs> I thought it was a funny, like, sort of way of telling the kids what yeah. to do. Right. And since when does she get to make up? Has she always made up the password or does... Like it's the prefect or the head of house yeah. how does that work it's weird because sir, <laughs> sir uh cadigan makes up his own passwords but 
it never struck me as being a thing that the portraits did. Like clearly he broke the rules or was, you know, he had his own ideas about how to do things, but maybe it was the fat lady all along, Mm -hmm. in which case she has a gift for, uh, rhetoric or, or, you know, literary references. Mm. So anyway, 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 um, big question I had going into this chapter, you know, Hermione comes back from break. They're at Hogwarts and, you know, her arrival, she explicitly states, hi, Harry. Hi, Ginny. How was your holidays? And Ron's standing right there. Yeah. Is this over the top? Um, yeah, I just really need all this awkwardness to end because I can't take it anymore. Oh. It just hu- hurts my soul. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't think it's inappropriate for 16 year olds. I think this is pretty yeah. uh, standard behavior for people who are upset with each other and who haven't made up yet. Mm-hmm. And but Ron is trying though I think uh, you know he gets smothered right at the start uh, by Lavender but he tries to catch up with Harry and Hermione uh, at, at one point in the beginning of the chapter and yet he still gets the cold shoulder mm-hmm. and Harry even mentions to Hermione that he had hoped that you know some time off being home for the holidays maybe would have helped to kind of mend this uh broken relationship this broken friendship that's going on you would think it would yeah but hermione has also drawn her line and said you know ron needs to apologize i'm not going to forgive him for what he's done he needs to man up and, and come and actually apologize for it and ron just doesn't have the emotional intelligence to figure out how to approach hermione or to even really like comprehend what he has done wrong I think at this point he's right. he knows at least at this point that he doesn't want to be with Lavender, but he's not putting two and two together of I need to actively break up to actively choose to repair my relationship with Hermione. He's just expecting to be let off the hook because he has been let off the hook every single other time. Mm-hmm. Right. I do feel like the the time away from one another outside of the school should have naturally mended a couple of these bridges. Yeah. And Ron should have went in. Went back to Hogwarts with a clear head. Yeah. But he didn't because he's a stubborn git. <laughs> <laughs> well, so is Hermione when it comes to uh, Draco Malfoy. And Harry, much like he was able to tell Mr. Weasley and to tell Lupin over the holidays, he's finally able to fill Hermione in on what happened that night of the uh, Slug Club Christmas party when he overheard Snape and Draco. And Hermione, of course, reacts the way that we would have expected her to react. But she even goes a little bit further than that, and Harry calls her out on it. She he basically, is there nothing that I say to you that's going to convince you that something is going on here? Mm-hmm. And wh- why are his friends so reluctant now it, it's like putting the evidence literally right in front of them and yet nothing she's reluctant but she also admits and harry has to kind of pry it out of her but she does admit that he's right yeah i agree i also think that hermione is maybe falling into the same trap that lupin was falling into in the last chapter of thinking that Harry just sort of like ha- has like a natural um, bias against Snape and Draco. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and on one hand, she admits this is the most incriminating bit of evidence so far, but she doesn't go further. She doesn't actually say, well, this is something we need to devote considerable resources on. There's just something else going on. And I don't know from a writing standpoint if Joe intended this to be a little bit more of a weird sticking point. For Harry, because like I, I think at this point, the evidence is too too heavy on on Draco being up to something and Snape being up to something. The fact that we have to wait all year to figure out what it was is is grueling. So I think maybe there should have been a little bit more um, nuance to it, or more more cause for the these friends of Harry's not to believe him than just either old prejudices, what Lupin said, or you know something big should happen where like Harry should be proven wrong. Uh, about Draco in a big way. And then the rest of the book is like, no, 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 I, I got to own my prejudice. Like Lupin was right. I'm, you know, and then only to be figure out at the end that he wasn't, you know? So 
I think there maybe should have been like another level of this because it is just sad to see that nobody's believing Harry when he's completely in the right. Yeah, especially because Harry saw something going on with his own two eyes. It's not like he heard somebody heard something from somebody who heard something from somebody like this was directly. He saw the situation directly and that should be taken very seriously. Mm -hmm. I, I will say in this chapter at least maybe it's meant to be put to rest because when Harry brings it to Dumbledore and we'll talk about this in a moment, but, and Dumbledore doesn't do anything for about it. We're just supposed to take it as like a mystery that won't get resolved anytime soon. Right? Like, I think it's just a yeah. way that we're just supposed to live with this mystery, this subplot. Exactly. And and I have a huge issue with the way that Dumbledore behaves and we can talk about that, but before we get there, uh, because it does tie directly into your Quizits question, Eric, from yeah. last week. We learned that uh, the trio are finally going to be able to take apparition lessons. Harry, though, is, of course, very experienced uh, in this field already, so much so that he becomes a celebrity. And everybody... <laughs> this was, like, the dumbest thing I read in this chapter. <laughs> Whoa. He's, he's the... He's the celebrity apparator. Like everybody wants to talk to him. What is it like to apparate this, apparate that? Like, isn't he famous? And doesn't he doesn't he already draw enough attention to himself? He needs to be like the. I don't, I don't know. I get your thoughts. Well, but this is something they will be able to do too soon. Like mm. they're not one day going to fight Voldemort. Well, they don't. They don't know yeah. it yet. <laughs> but. Um, this is something, this is a skill that they look forward to learning themselves. And then they find out that Harry has already done it. They want to know what it's like. So, but of course, Harry's already done it. Harry's like already done half the stuff <laughs> that he's already made a, 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 a I, I was, I'm sorry. I was actually surprised that we learned that the lessons are going to be by a ministry of magic instructor. And like, there's no resistance from Harry on that, despite just getting into a fight with Scrimgeour, like he doesn't have any issue issue with being taught by the ministry. Yeah. Isn't that like, wouldn't that annoy him in this moment? It's certainly interesting. I, I, I love that you pointed this out. And why do they need to be taught by the ministry? Because this is like really serious stuff. What are they, 16? I mean, it's like driving, right? It's it's a dry, it's a state-sponsored driving test, essentially, is, is the way I look at it. Driving's dangerous. You... Uh, risk everyone's life when you go out in your car and it's 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 everybody's best interest that you learn to do it right because a lot of lives are at stake so i i think it needs to be the ministry in the sense of the ministry is the uh leading you know like agreed upon body to teach this kind of a lesson to mm. you so it's it's like because the ministry ultimately probably licenses apparition or it's in their domain to make sure that you're mm -hmm. doing it correctly. You could also draw comparisons from this back to the beginning of the chapter, Andrew, when you were talking about abstinence and even needing to be a certain age to do certain things. There being, you know, just, just a thought. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. There are a lot of dangerous things that happen at Hogwarts that are taught there. So true. I still don't really understand why the ministry has to do this. But anyway. Yeah, I think it's a fair question. Let's get to uh, Dumbledore's office. Andrew, I see here. Uh, so when Harry gets there, he tells him about the encounter that he had with the minister over the holidays. Mm -hmm. And one of the most famous lines in the, in the Potter series, he says that he's Dumbledore's man through and through. Yeah. So, and what happens after that is really important. So... Fox gives out this little singing cry. Yeah. And then after that, Dumbledore has tears in his eyes. So two things on this. First of all, I wonder if this was one of Dumbledore's last, if not the final joyous moment in his life, the final moment where he's brought to tears because Fox's cry was a signal of Harry's true loyalty to Dumbledore. This happened, and we'll get to this later in Connecting the Threads, um, in Chamber of Secrets as well, where Fox marks loyalty. Um, I, it was just really sad to me reading this and thinking that, wow, this may have been one of Dumbledore's final moments of pride, of joy, of happiness, of feeling so closely connected to somebody. 
you guys agree? Yeah, and I think in retrospect, it makes it even more bittersweet, you know? Definitely. Right. Yeah. Reading it for the first time, you don't know what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. But for me, this new stuff from Crimes of Grindelwald about the Dumbledore legend and how a phoenix will come to you just really kind of revives for me this interest in phoenixes as a creature, yes. as, a, as a beast, and how Fox came to Harry in Chamber of Secrets. I know, Laura, you, you're eager to connect, connect those threads. But, like, it, um, it's just so interesting that the loyalty to Dumbledore that he's showing now that's causing Fox to cry, also, like, Dumbledore in Book 2 was, like, nothing but immense loyalty could have called Fox to you. So Fox is, like bonding with Harry now over their love of Dumbledore or something like that. Like their, their show of, of faith for this man, this deeply flawed man. Mm -hmm. um, very curious. Like, I just can't wait for future Fantastic Beast films to talk about what draws Phoenixes to Dumbledore's and why the, that family mm -hmm. is so special. Definitely. And I think it, it is curious that chapter 17 of Chamber of Secrets in chapter 17 of Half-Blood Prince, both have this loyalty connection uh, with Fox yeah. and with Dumbledore. And by the way, I'm looking forward to seeing Krems of Grindelwald again for the very end when the Phoenix is reborn. Because does he, does the Phoenix give out a little cry there? Mm -hmm. I feel like he did. He or she did. It's the cry of being set on fire by, uh, <laughs> by <laughs> Grindelwald. <laughs> Ouch. Well, or is it a loyalty cry? Is that supposed to be telling us something? Yeah, maybe. Anyway. Yeah. True, but he also just kind of took that baby phoenix and threw it up into the air, and it magically became a full-grown phoenix. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's how it works. From what I remember in Dumbledore's office, we see Fox kind of grow through different times where Harry's in the office. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... All right, well, we have that really tender moment between Harry and, and Dumbledore, and then we also have the conversation about Snape and Draco. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask, were we surprised by Dumbledore's reaction, and is it fair for him to tell Harry just to kind of cast his thoughts aside? This is something, it's been his mission, really, not just from the beginning of, of Half-Blood Prince, but... It's really been his mission since he's gotten at Hogwarts to kind of nail Draco on something. Yeah. And I don't think it's it's right, especially after what Harry has just said to him. That the fact that Dumbledore is withholding so much information from Harry and and that he was defending him. Harry was defending him to Scrimgeour Hour in the last chapter. Uh, I just feel like it's just kind of eh. Trust Dumbledore. <laughs> Everything will work out. Yeah. And I think that's all by design, right? Because Dumbledore can't very well tell Harry, okay, yeah, Harry, you're totally right. Um, yeah, Draco's trying to kill me, but I'm going to let Snape kill me. And this is all for sort of like the larger story arc of setting you up to die. <laughs> So that Voldemort will die, but then you'll come back. Like, I think Dumbledore's trying not to overload Harry. I think he's trying to keep him focused right. on one particular objective. Because um, unfortunately, Harry, he can be pretty easily sidetracked. Right. It's just so manipulative that Dumbledore, you know, this is the first chapter where Dumbledore gives Harry homework. And the homework is to track down Slughorn and ex extract a, a memory that you know, would normally be given under duress. And this is something that, you know, Dumbledore, Harry comes to Dumbledore with the full picture of everything that's literally going on between Snape, Draco, and the plot. And Dumbledore's just like, yeah, push it out of your mind, because he knows that if Harry were distracted, he wouldn't be able to get this memory from Slughorn. Like, if he just came clean to Harry, Harry wouldn't get him what he wants in that moment. And Harry's like, this has potentially been uh, built towards the entire year of school so far, that Dr Dumbledore has Slughorn in this position where he can sick Harry on him and get Harry to, you know, give him, you know, basically solve the puzzle piece. But what would have been the harm in Dumbledore just saying, okay, Harry, I'll speak with Professor Snape or I'll investigate the situation. That's all he would have had to have said in my mind. Yeah. Maybe just to like placate Harry a little bit, but 
he just tells Harry to completely forget about it. And honestly, like Harry's just been, I wouldn't say wrong place, wrong time, but he's just happened to be in these places where Draco has been and thinks that he's up to something. He's absolutely right. And I just think Dumbledore could have done a better job here instead of just saying, okay, well, you know what, Harry, forget about this. Let's dive into some memories and I'm going to give you some homework. (laughs) Yeah. Which is essentially an impossible task. I think at the outset, um, he, something that Dumbledore could have easily just done himself. You know, he should have placated him, um, but I don't agree with giving Harry more information than that. Because think about what would have happened if Harry knew that the plan was for Dumbledore to die and <laughs> for him to die. Well, I mean, you know how Harry reacts to things. He would have been like, there has to be another way. We have to do this differently. I can't lose you, Dumbledore. We can't lose you. Maybe he would have found another way. Mm. I don't know. I like to give him the benefit of the doubt. It's just the problem is Dumbledore was kind of a dick about it. I'd lo- I'd love to quote this comment. Uh, Harry asked him, Professor, did you understand? And he says, yes, Harry, blessed as I am with extraordinary brain power, I understood everything you told me. Mm-hmm. I think you might even consider the possibility that I understood more than you did. Like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that's Dumbledore's way of telling Harry, like, hey, yeah, I know what's going on in my school. Yeah. Right. Stop pestering me about this. Yeah, exactly. So before we get into the first memory here, we actually get some interesting backstory about the progression of Voldemort because they're reviewing, you know, sort of what they've learned so far. The very last memory we had was Dumbledore and uh, Riddle in the orphanage. And Dumbledore actually sort of pretty candidly talks about, you know, growing up, Tom Riddle growing up at Hogwarts and how the first couple of years he uh, developed a group of friends and also charmed, Dumbledore says, most of his peers. So most of the uh, Dumbledore's colleagues, the other teachers at school genuinely liked Tom Riddle. And it's uh, apart from being a perfect setup to the whole Slughorn, you know, revealing info he shouldn't kind of memory that we're going to see later. It also kind of gives us an important piece of the puzzle as far as to understand Tom Riddle. You kind of got to know that, like, he was attractive and persuasive and knew where to toe the line. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that's sort of a crucial interpretation that for to this day, in my mind, as far as like how I view Voldemort as a villain, this is the most compelling part to me. Like when he was 11, sure, he messed up, showed Dumbledore more than he wanted to. Um, but then immediately thereafter, and Dumbledore talks about this with Harry, kind of really was reserved and um, achieved everything he achieved by being a, a lot more cautious. But we'll mm-hmm. talk about this more in bonus muggle cast. Yes. Well, yeah, specifically in bonus muggle cast, I'd like to talk about his uh, Tom's Death Eater friends or friends in air quotes and what that sort of situation might have been like to actually be in school with Tom Riddle. But Dumbledore tells Harry, not a lot of people are willing to talk about young Tom Riddle. I don't know if it's due guilt or what. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So we dive into a memory that we do not get in the films at all. It is of um, Tom Riddle really meeting his family for the first time. And uh, he meets his uncle, Morphin, and he frames him <laughs> yeah. for the murder of his father and his grandparents. Uh, they do a little uh, parcel tongue communication, but uh, I, I don't, I wonder, it, it's almost impossible to think that Tom went to the gaunt home that evening with the intent of looking to kill his father. Um, it's almost like he gets enlightened by Morphin as to the fact that it was actually his mom who was a witch. And his father is just this muggle that clearly Morphin uh, has no like for. Um, but I'm impressed by how advanced Tom is at this young age, because not only does he frame his uncle for these murders, but he alters his memory so that he actually believes that it was him who did it. Yeah. It's pretty surprising. Dumbledore uses the phrase, uh, implants a memory. That's what he says. He implants a memory. So 
Tom Riddle gave him gave Morphin his memory of killing the Riddles somehow. Like it, it's it's pretty surprising and disturbing because you wonder if Tom has done this again mm. and how many times he's done it because this this wields a lot of power. Absolutely. It, it's 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 highly disturbing. And I would also say though that Dumbledore he's able to get into Azkaban to see Morphin to extract this memory from him. Yet later on in this chapter, it's clear that he's not able to get the right memory from Slughorn. So I almost wonder how that's possible, um, given just how powerful Dumbledore is. And we can talk a little bit more about that later. There's also a bit of fan service uh, in this part of the chapter. And, and there's a bit later on as well, or at least I like to think of it as fan service because Tom is able to use magic without being detected by the ministry. And Harry calls this out. And I almost think like that's a question that any listener of the show would ask. Well, hold on a second. <laughs> Harry gets, you know, mail almost right away after blowing up Aunt Marge. How can Tom do all of this without being detected? And Eric, you I think you bring up a really great point. He not only does it in the home of the Gaunts, but he uses magic at the Riddle home. And that should have been detected way easier and, and should have had ministry officials deployed almost right away um, mm. because it's a killing curse. Yeah, I'm really surprised that this question gets brought up. Um, I think Harry asks, you know, why, why wasn't it de de detected or whatever? And, and the rule of thumb is that they couldn't tell whether Morphin or uh, Tom Riddle did it in Morphin's home. But then again, I'm thinking, what about the Riddle house or something? I, I'm just, I'm just really unclear as far as the, the trace should work one of those places and not the other. So it's, it's, it's pretty confusing to me. It's interesting. You call it fan service, Micah. I think you're, you're just forgetting how glorious the books were. Um, we just don't have time in movies to dive into this type of information. Whereas in the books, there's plenty of room for J.K. Rowling to <laughs> yeah, insert it. That's fair. Maybe. I mean, you know, we get frustrated by some things in Fantastic Beasts. Mm -hmm. And if this was a book instead, we almost certainly would get the answer sooner instead of later. Yeah. <laughs> I.e. McGonagall and other things that we're very confused by. Mm. Sure. But that's besides the point. Yep. Yeah, I do think this is somewhat of a plot hole, though. Really? Yeah. I mean, it, as Eric and Micah brought up, this doesn't make sense. Mm. Like, uh, on the outside, like, when you're reading the book, you're like, oh, okay, there's there's the why. But then you think about it for two seconds, and you're like, wait, it still doesn't make sense, because it would have detected him like he went to a muggle home and used a killing curse. Like how is that yeah. not setting right. off, you know, alarms at the ministry? Right. Everybody under 17 has the trace on them. And so no matter where they go, if they cast magic, it's outside of Hogwarts or a, or a, you know, an allowed place, the trace goes off and the trace wouldn't go off. If it were Morphin that cast the spell, it just wouldn't because Morphin's not underage. So, like, very specifically, it was an underage wizard yeah. who cast... It's his wand. I mean, that's uh. that's the one thing maybe you could argue is that Tom uses his wand. And then you can make the argument, okay, well, maybe he killed them after the trace had already dissolved or whatever it does. But then you go back into the memory of Slughorn and he's wearing the ring. So clearly he did it at some point when he was at Hogwarts. Yeah. But then I guess the question is, is the trace actually on the wizard or is it on their wand? But Harry blows up Aunt Marge without his wand. and Exactly. Yeah. And and Dobby, what, causes the cake to fall? It's a hover charm or whatever. within the Yeah, and he got blamed for it. Yeah. Yeah. But then it's within the dwelling. So Right. They're tracking. Yeah. They don't know who individually. Yeah, so it's just... So it's... if they don't know who individually is conducting magic, then um, mm -hmm. no matter your age, then I struggle to think that the trace is down to the person. I don't know. Right. That is a weird question. Yeah. Get Joe back on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Where's she at? We're going to bombard her with these questions. Uh, but it is important just to note that in this memory, both the ring and the locket 
are mentioned. Um, obviously, Tom ends up taking the ring, uh, but there is a, a call out uh, to his mom and the locket. So I think there's a couple questions here. We'll probably save also for that bonus muggle cast discussion. One about, um, which I think Eric, you brought up a little bit earlier, the, um, the charming personality of Tom and how it's been able to work on some of Dumbledore's colleagues. We'll obviously talk about Slughorn, but I'm interested to know who else yeah. it worked on. And then Dumbledore clearly has, some suspicions of Tom early on at Hogwarts, not just from his time visiting him at the orphanage. And I kind of blame him here because I think he could have acted with a little bit more intent and been a little bit more, uh, done a little bit more oversight on him. Mm -hmm. The only thing I think can clear this up is, you know, the chamber of secrets was opened in, I think 1941, 1942, like, we're going to be able to see this era of Dumbledore not prosecuting Tom Riddle or not going – like deciding not to blame Tom Riddle and somehow allowing Hagrid to take the blame. Like if if – I think based on what Dumbledore already knows about Tom Riddle and, and or suspects, the excuse he gives Harry in this chapter of I was just going to let him live his life like I you know, gave him the benefit of the doubt doesn't hold any water when a student has been murdered. So I, I think that, you know, ultimately we're going to have to see a Jude Law Dumbledore um, because if the Crimes of Grindelwald, if the Fantastic Beasts series ends in 1945, all of this will have happened at, at Hogwarts. And hopefully we get more of a substantial reason as to how or why Tom Riddle was able to operate the way that he was through Hogwarts. And it's probably Dumbledore's fault. Yeah, yeah it is interesting because on a former episode, we had posited that the reason Dumbledore made this special, you know, house visit to the orphanage was because he saw the potential for Voldemort or for Tom Riddle, excuse me, to be somebody who could be easily radicalized a la Grindelwald. Yeah. Yeah. And then for him to make that visit and see what he sees and then just sort of give Tom a blank slate when he arrives at Hogwarts does raise some questions. For sure. Yeah, definitely. Uh, before we jump into the, the sluggish memory, uh, there was one other thing I wanted to bring up. And Tom's good looks are mentioned a number of times in this chapter. And is it a coincidence that it's mentioned many times that both he and Harry are said to look like their fathers? Mm, could be a little parallel that J.K. Rowling is getting at. Yeah. Yeah, she likes to draw tons of parallels between Harry and Tom Riddle. Yeah, because even Morphin points out the fact that he looks like that muggle that lives up the hill or wherever he Yo, is. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, good point. Tom Riddle doesn't age well, though, does he? <laughs> I mean, he loses a nose by the end of his life. True. So <laughs> the parallel kind of falls apart. Do any of us look like our fathers? By the way, do we think? Do we get told that? Oh, God. Yes, unfortunately. Sometimes I'm staring at myself yeah. in the mirror for a long period of time, and like my dad <laughs> pops out of my face. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> or do you, when you see younger photos of your, uh, your dad? Right, right. Does it look like for me? Yeah, that totally. Look yeah, the yeah. There, there's a photo of me uh, at a wedding a couple of years ago dancing with my mom, and I think I look a lot like her, actually. So I probably inherited more of my mother's like facial structure. Is your mom blonde? Because I understand you're blonde right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, we we used to, I think both of us have lighter hair, and then mine is uh, currently artificial at the moment, or colored. <laughs> I know. Yeah. That's, but uh, yeah, anyway, I thought that was an interesting, let's draw it back to ourselves every time we can. But uh, yeah, right. Laura, who do you look like? Um, You know, it changes as like I go through different phases of my life. Mm -hmm. So when I was younger, definitely more like my dad but as i get older i do see a lot more of my mom coming out mm -hmm. if that makes sense yeah and does your mom have blue hair too uh no hers is purple right oh what now. really <laughs> yeah oh you get, you get the hair that is dying awesome. after your mom i there guess you. there yeah. you go mm -hmm. awesome love it <laughs> anyway memory number two mm. Dumbledore warns us that this is going to be a quick one. Yeah. <laughs> um, and what's interesting about this memory and what I'm excited to talk about is 
we learn eventually that um, Slughorn tampered with the memory, so it kind of jumps around, <laughs> and Slughorn t- tampered with tampered with it so that he would look better. <laughs> um, but there's this quote that the tampered with memory proved difficult to empty into the pensive as though they had congealed slightly. Mm. Did memories go bad? Yeah, I thought this was really interesting. Like, when a memory is modified, it congeals. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I don't know, like, is this... I guess I was wondering, is this also the product of Slughorn's shoddy work? Because we see in the memory, he did not do a very good job of modifying this. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Which is also kind of surprising, because Dumbledore remarks that Slughorn is... Uh, you know, a very well practiced wizard. Um, yeah. Like, was this memory supposed to fool anybody? Because it's a very, like, it's a very like amateurish seeming yeah. attempt. I think it seems like it was rushed. Like Slughorn knew Dumbledore wanted mm. it, and he was like, "Ah, oh, shit! <laughs> I gotta, <laughs> I gotta." Put, put like pump the brakes on this one yeah so it just it seems like it was a desperate attempt to very quickly modify the events of the past or at least he how as he remembered them you gotta imagine if memories can be uh modified and even the supposedly impartial pensive can be fooled by a modified memory you'd at least get a visual of slughorn saying the words that he spoke like Dumbledore, instead it's this you know this fog that engulfs the room and then slughorn's voiceover going you'll go wrong someday <laughs> but ideally you you would see there wouldn't be any fog you would just see the scene play out as it should have like as as the person remembering wants it to have done yeah. So I, I think I think that's why I think you're right, Laura, in suggesting that it was like rushed. I have so many questions about this. Like when Laura was kind of just getting at this, but when exactly did Slughorn decide to alter this memory? Mm-hmm. Does does and yet he still has the real memory in his actual head because mm-hmm. Dumbledore thinks Harry can still get that out of him. So how how do these two versions of the memory exist? Like when you're pulling a memory out of your head, shouldn't it physically leave your head? It should. I don't. I don't. You're but you're duplicating well, it. You're right. It's confusing. I mean, have you ever like think about a situation where uh, maybe you were recounting, you know, a, a series of events to somebody, and perhaps you leave certain details out because they're either not relevant or you don't want that person to think poorly of you or anything right. like that i think this is very similar to that so like yeah we human beings are capable of having sort of multiple versions of a memory um the one that we sort of like give people <laughs> and the one that we that we know is like the actual series of events mm-hmm. right and it's interesting that this memory comes right after tom riddle altered somebody else's memory permanently uh, yeah with seemingly no yeah. duplicate <laughs> it, it and exactly when did dumbledore go calling for this memory from slughorn mm-hmm. like, was it prior that summer it, it to me slughorn holds the truth to it, what Voldemort is up to. And I'm surprised that he's not more highly sought after by Voldemort because you'd think that the person who told him about what it is that he now uses to be able to stay immortal, essentially is, is still alive and well. And we know Slughorn's a bit on the run, but it's, it seems like he would be more of a target to me. You're right. But now he's at Hogwarts where he's mm. safe. Maybe that's one reason he wanted to go to Hogwarts, even though he didn't really want to. That's a great point. But maybe, I mean, maybe don't, maybe Voldemort should have disposed of him sooner. Like, you know, during the first war or something like that. Like, we don't get, we don't get this impression. And Slughorn would be less able to be on the fence about the Death Eaters and all that now if he had been chased and hunted back then. Yeah. Um, Right. I was going to say maybe Tom Riddle just forgot, but he couldn't possibly forget who 
told him about the Horcrux magic. Yeah, you never forget your first. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Anyway, uh, so we hear the word Horcruxes in this chapter. It's the first time, I believe, we hear it in the entire series. Mm -hmm. And in this memory, in the movie, we ne we don't hear the word. We only hear it when Harry gets the real memory from from Slughorn. So, I now, I don't remember exactly how it plays out in the book, but it seems like, now we have the the key piece of information. Harry, for whatever reason, doesn't even ask what a Horcrux is. Right. Is the future memory just to find out the number that Voldemort may or may not have created? Because to me, now you have the information, and I don't remember as readers where we just, holy shit, like what's a Horcrux? Mm -hmm. Google, like let's find out what this thing is. Harry should be all over this, and he's not. I think it's a bit of oversight on his part. Well, and he, it, it, the book even goes out of its way to say that Harry felt there was nothing significant in the memory. <laughs> there was this new word that Harry never heard before. Well, well why Harry's, would... Harry's still too busy being mad that Dumbledore won't <laughs> engage him about Snape and Draco. <laughs> there was nothing significant. You know what was significant? Snape and Draco, what's up with that? It's just, you know, Dumbledore is the one failing to provide the context here. Uh, Horcrux is, is obviously not only a piece of the puzzle, but the whole game. Um, and Dumbledore fails to provide relevance. Like, Harry's focused on Voldemort, uh, Voldemort's character, and Harry gets out of that memory. Oh, okay. Um, Voldemort tried to ask a question and got rebuffed. Like, that's what he gets out of the thing. He's like, oh, what a useless memory. Yeah. Dumbledore is supposed to be the one there who goes, well, no, 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 no. Here's why what he was asking is important and then provide all the context in the world. Instead, he's just letting Harry go and then for months try and get this memory from Sugorn. But, but yeah. Well, Micah, t to get back to one of your questions, why does he need the memory? Is it for the number? Yes, the number is extremely important because they need to know how many horcruxes are in play here you, and you but can't do you go think and defeat that dumbledore knows that like what else I, I yeah there could be something else in this memory that's important but there's no way that dumbledore knows that there's a number tied to this why it, it, why not i, I just think I mean, that it's that's, a reasonable thing to to look into yeah but i just think horcruxes that should give you enough to go on for from harry's standpoint i think it should have given him enough to go on he should have asked dumbledore what is a horcrux mm. no i, mean, I agree I'm assuming, with that i'm assuming I mean, maybe hermione he inevitably ends up asking right yeah. so he asked somebody yeah. it may be in the next chapter but i just feel like he's to to the point that was raised by i don't know if it was laura but like he's not on his game he's he's too focused he's too sidetracked by draco and snape and he's and this memory is just, he doesn't even think it's significant. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if it, maybe it was J.K. Rowling trying to throw us off the trail for some reason, just to surprise us a little later on. Yeah. But yeah. it, I don't know, it seems very glaring of a thing. At this point, Dumbledore's already encountered two Horcruxes and destroyed two himself. Uh, or, or the diary was destroyed by Harry, but Dumbledore is held in his hands the remains of not one but two horcruxes the diary and the ring yeah and so he does already know that there are multiple horcruxes and is actively leaving hogwarts in search of at least one other so having the final number is sort of helpful but at the end of the day if uh canon is to be believed and pottermore and all the various supplemental material voldemort never actually had seven horcruxes uh and certainly not before he died uh, I think either Harry was supposed to be the seventh one or something went wrong or whatever, but he, he never really got seven at once. And by the time he makes one out of Frank Bryce's murder, uh, which I think is when Nagini becomes a Horcrux uh, after his revival, it's, you know, the diary has already been destroyed. Mm -hmm. So there's never quite seven Horcruxes. Mm -hmm. But it's his desire to create. He asks specifically about seven. Yeah. It's true. So, I think Dumbledore is also just trying to get the full context of right what Tom yeah. was told, right? Yeah, because that 
might ultimately give Dumbledore a clue about where another one might be. He's got to do his due diligence here. Yeah. And also like this, this is investigative, right? So he's, he's trying to determine, okay, like I'm pretty sure (laughs) Slughorn did actually tell Tom about Horcruxes and sort of provide him the impetus to get started down that path. But I can't blame him for that. Or I can't sort of like, express the role that he played in that without having definitive proof um i just want to jump back to altering memories it makes me wonder so you can alter your memory and then put it back in your head if if that's how it works this would be great in terms of dealing with any mental health issues that you struggle with Mm. maybe you want to get over some guilt or you want to stop thinking about something that makes you really sad. If you can just adjust or wipe your own memory, um, that would be fantastic. I'm... <laughs> well, you you kind of can because actually, when you when you have memories, you're not actually remembering the event as it happened. You're remembering the last time you remembered it. Right. So people's memories do naturally change over time. I mean, that's... yeah, I know, but I'm just speaking broadly about like dealing with issues that really tear you up. Like mm. this would be great to have in the real world. And I mean, is there even therapy in the wizarding world? Is therapy just altering your memory so you don't have to deal with it anymore? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the way the pensive is first described, I think, in book four is you can literally take a memory out and then it will not be in your head anymore. Mm-hmm. Dumbledore himself says he keeps a pensive because of that reason that he finds himself having too many thoughts at times. There we go, Dumbledore boasting about how intelligent he is again. But yeah. he, you can take it out of your mind completely. So you wouldn't even need to modify the memory of like a traumatic mm-hmm. event. You would simply remove it and then be mm. mostly cured. Well, maybe if you want to remember an old flame, you can just alter it to remember just the good parts and not the part where they went and found somebody else. Right. It wasn't you. Yet <laughs> there is tremendous guilt on Slughorn's part. Despite the fact that he's altered this memory, there's a great scene in the movie with the fish Uh and the whole story about how Lily was the one who gave it to Slughorn and that the day he came down and the fish wasn't in the bowl anymore was the day that she died. And I just, he feels a tremendous amount of guilt and a tremendous amount of regret. And, And I would say even some embarrassment over the fact that he was the one, essentially, not that Tom wouldn't have found another way or learned about them through another means, but mm. he gave Tom the tools yeah. from an academic standpoint in order to be able to go and create these Horcruxes. He validated what Tom had already clearly learned, and that that I think that eats away at him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it is embarrassing because it was all because he's very... Uh, vulnerable to flattery yeah which is you know the same way that harry eventually builds up the sort of rapport to get what he needs (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah i also found it interesting too that you know in this chapter and really throughout this book there's a huge focus on two former heads of well snape is the current head of slytherin slughorn was the head of slytherin both were potions masters and yet they're both very integral, one in the rise of Voldemort, the other in the fall. So mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of comparisons to be made between the two. So final thing that happens in this chapter, um, as their meeting ends, the Phineas portrait questions why Harry could do something that Dumbledore can't. And Dumbledore repl- replies, I wouldn't expect you to. <laughs> and Fox cries again, just like she did earlier in the chapter and again commenting on loyalty but i wonder if this time it's the other way around i wonder if it's i wonder if fox is commenting on or responding to dumbledore's loyalty to harry yeah i think so yeah okay maybe harry is a secret dumbledore <laughs> wow oh god they are Please. descended from the same line coming Please, in no. quidditch through the ages the movie series <laughs> I mean, yeah. Why does Fox care about Harry? Because Dumbledore cares about it, Harry. But it is also worth mentioning really quickly that Harry, again, we were talking about fan service earlier. 
um, asks Dumbledore about using legitimacy or Veretta serum yeah. to try and get this memory from Slughorn. And I don't disagree with this. Like, call the Ministry, get the Aurors down there, do some work on Slughorn to tie him to a chair or whatever you got to do, and get this. This memory is everything to the series. Yeah. yeah. To helping bring down Voldemort. So I'm with Harry. <laughs> <laughs> So hashtag we're going to talk about memories a little more in a second. We asked patrons a question about whose memory they would dive into in the wizarding world. But first, our second sponsor is Robin Hood. If you have a little bit of money saved up or you're looking for a way to plan for the future, may I recommend Robin Hood? Robin Hood is an investing app that lets you buy and sell stocks, ETFs, options and cryptos all commission free while other brokerages charge up to ten dollars for every trade robin hood doesn't charge any commission fees so you can trade stocks and keep all of your profits and put them back in the gringotts baby plus there is no account minimum deposit needed to get started so you can start investing at any level the simple intuitive design of robin hood makes investing easy for newcomers and experts alike you can view easy to understand charts and market data and place a trade in just four taps on your smartphone you can also view stock collections, such as 100 Most Popular. That way, you can get some guidance on which stocks you should invest in. With Robinhood, you can learn how to invest in the market as you build your portfolio, discover new stocks, track your favorite companies, and get custom notifications for price movements so you never miss the right moment to invest. I love that. Robinhood is giving listeners of MuggleCast a free stock like Apple, Ford, or Sprint to help build your portfolio. Sign up at MuggleCast.RobinHood.com. Get investing if you have a little money and want to put it somewhere smart. MuggleCast.RobinHood.com, and they'll get you started with a free stock. So over at Patreon.com slash MuggleCast, we asked a question about memories since this chapter is all about memories. We said, which Wizarding World character's memory would you want to enter and why? And I said, bonus points if you can tell us how you'd extract that memory. <laughs> Gabriella said, we need McGonagall's memories. She must have so many stories. She's seen so many things in her life, not only as a witch, but also as a cat. Does she communicate with other cats while in cat form? <laughs> Alex said, I'd like to see Dumbledore's childhood so we could sort out this whole Aurelius Dumbledore thing. Um, yeah, that's that's a good one. <laughs> Vins said, Hagrid, he does a lot of errands for Dumbledore and goes off grid sometimes. I'm curious what adventures he has when he does. Also, I want to see his memories during his school days. I know we've seen bits and pieces of it during Chamber. Maybe a memory of his school days before he was expelled. Mm. About uh, from Jessica Hardy, I'd like to see Draco's when he was indoctrined into the Death Eaters. Was he excited, scared? Was he only doing it for his parents, or did he really believe in Voldemort? Was there an initiation ceremony? How would I extract it from him? Well, I'm blonde, and I think he likes blondes. <laughs> <laughs> That's why Eric went blonde recently. Yep. Doug England said, any of James Potter's memories after Snape's worst memory? I think most of what we see of James is tainted because it comes from Snape's perspective. So anything that would show how he went from a Snape bullying, immature 15 year old to head boy or how he finally won Lily over or why a pure blood wizard with a hefty inheritance would risk everything to become an original member of the Order of the Phoenix. And this, Doug, is why people want some Marauder stories from J.K. Rowling. Yeah. And Virtuous Steve would love to see the world through Luna's eyes. Quirky, unpredictable, but true essences shining through like disguised Harry at the Weasley wedding. You can read more of people's answers over at patreon.com slash mugglecast. Thanks to everybody who, who participated. We do those questions from time to time to uh, get some answers from people that we then read on the show. Yeah. So let's connect some threads here. There's a, there, there are a lot. There are a lot. And uh, we're getting towards the end of Chamber of Secrets, too. There's only, I think, one more chapter. So um, we'll have to uh, do our best to tie what happens in the future of Half-Blood Prince back to other chapters uh, in Chamber of Secrets. Uh, so Chapter 17 of Chamber of Secrets is called The Heir of Slytherin. Um, and, of course, this chapter is all about Tom Riddle. 
Um, Harry confronts a younger version of Tom Riddle in both chapters. And he unknowingly destroys the first of Voldemort's Horcruxes uh, in Chapter 17 of Chamber of Secrets. And he learns the word Horcrux in Chapter 17 of Half-Blood Prince. I can't believe all this. Uh, Chapter 17 of Half-Blood Prince begins with, and Chapter 17 of Chamber of Secrets concludes in McGonagall's office. So um, the trio, or, well, the trio of Harry, Ron, and Ginny apparate into McGonagall's office in the beginning of Half-Blood Prince. And of course, they return to McGonagall's office after they escape the Chamber of Secrets. And again, interesting that it was that pairing, those three. Mm-hmm. Not not a coincidence. Um, and we the last one we talked about this, I think, Fox um, and Harry's loyalty to Dumbledore really shines through in both chapters. It is uh, his loyalty that calls Fox into the Chamber of Secrets uh, to help him out. And uh, we see that again in this chapter of Half-Blood Prince with the uh, the little cry that uh, Fox makes. I'll never be over how she did this. I know. This is just constantly crazy to me. I want to know like what the process is. Right. Is this is this something where she sat down when she was writing Half-Blood Prince and then referred back to what she'd already written and planted all these Easter eggs? Or was this already planned yeah. as far back as when she wrote Chamber of Secrets? What was what was the line? I forget. She gave some quote where she said that this book could have been the second in the series or or something to that effect, right? The plot line of Half-Blood Prince was initially supposed to be used for Chamber of Secrets, but it gave too much away early on. Is that? That's right. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh-huh. Crazy, yeah. crazy. But it's what's what's it called? Ring theory? Is that what mm-hmm. what connects? Uh, yeah, ring theory, literary alchemy. It's referred to, um, but yeah, the idea that you'd have these concentric circles within a set that relate to each other more specifically. It's also just has to do with the way that stories are told, the like things like the rule of threes, and that are most more powerful if repeated. Yeah. Yeah. The parallels are really shocking. Yeah. And then just like from a literary perspective, this would be known as a frame narrative, wherein like books one and seven, two and six, three and five have, you know, callbacks to each other. Interesting. All right. MVP of the week now. Mine is Fox for marking loyalty. That was one of the most beautiful moments in this book. I gave mine to Morphin just because... I mean, he got taken advantage of by Riddle, by Dumbledore. I mean, the guy just, despite everything that he stood for, he just still, I don't know. I just gave him the MVP, mostly because... It's like a sympathy MVP. I mean, I was going to say... What the- mostly because, yeah, the other three were already written and I had to pick somebody <laughs> else. Oh, poor Morphin. <laughs> Micah, stand up for your guy, like Dueling Club. Like, uh, yeah. Morphin at least lasts a long time in Azkaban. Like, mm. you know. Yeah, but he probably likes it in Azkaban. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Making the most of his situation. Uh, I gave mine to Tom Riddle, the MVP who clearly owns Morphin. Um, really just thinking on his feet. Uh, you know, I don't think he arrived there with the intent of framing Morphin for the murder that he was about to commit of his father. Um, but nevertheless, that's what happened. And I think it's uh, really, really accomplished magic. The fact that Morphin for the rest of his life uh, thought that it was he who had done it. And, you know, it's just pretty clever. So props to Tom Riddle for being 16 and having lots of advanced magic. And I chose Dumbledore because like it or not, Everything Dumbledore does is by design. Love him. And now let's rename the chapter. Mine <laughs> is Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, chapter 17. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Ilvermorny chant, if I'm not uh, mistaken. <laughs> yeah, I ripped it from Ilvermorny. My apologies. <laughs> nice. Uh not sure how to follow that, but uh, <laughs> Harry Potter, we should have let you go last. Uh, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, uh, Chapter 17, Homework, Harry. Okay. I, uh, mine's a little bit of a stretch, but screw it. Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, Chapter 17, More Finn. 
Oh, I get it. We get, we get, I think. Yeah, we get more, more Finn in this chapter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mine is Harry Potter and the Half Blood Prince, chapter 17 Abstinence. Mm. (laughs) The best way to prevent a child or a hangover. (laughs) I mean, also, I mean, Dumbledore is abstaining quite a bit. (laughs) Yeah. That was some foreshadowing. (laughs) Mm. Wow. I just thought of another one. What is it? Uh, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, Chapter 17. Not my memory, you bitch. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Uh, All right. Now it's time for some Quizzage. Cool. Last week's question was, how much do apparition classes cost? And based on the sign that was on the common room door... Uh, in this chapter, we find out that they cost 12 galleons for the entire class. I did do a little bonus secondary question. How much is that per week? And people got that question right as well. So classes last 12 weeks. They're 12 galleons, which means one galleon per week is the cost of apparition lessons. So uh, people... That's who, a great deal. Yeah. Think of how much you save on travel by learning how to apparate. And time. Oh, gosh, yeah. And you don't burn any fossil fuels, presumably. So, like, it's a green <laughs> effort, you know, green <laughs> footprint. Um, but uh, the people who got uh, the 12 weeks correct, Real Slim Brady, Marley's Not a Muggle, and Neil Da Grass Tai Sun on Twitter. And the people who broke it down, one per week, Huffle Puffin, uh, at Niagara Love, Fluffy McNutters, Jennifer, Lame Miserab. Megan, Count Ravioli, Towering Tyler, Erica, Young Susie Blood, Charlie, Father of Dragons, The Ravenclaw, Hobbit Guy, Sarah, and Retta Gambo. And speaking of Retta Gambo, she wrote in, Apparition lessons cost 12 galleons or one a week. When you asked for the weekly breakdown, I was so nervous that I was going to have to do math with the 29 newts to a, canutes to a sequel, sickle and 29 or 17 sickles to a galleon. Really, it wasn't that difficult. Hashtag Quizich. So it's glad. And we even had a guy, Robert, the Robert Glass, who wrote in and said, uh, Jeopardy answer, by the way, what is 12 galleons total? And he actually did the conversion to U.S. dollars and said one galleon per week or seventy nine dollars and sixty eight U.S. Cents. Wow. US. Well, that's way more expensive. I remember yeah. you galleons. back in the day, yeah. I think CNN had a currency converter on their site and it was like so cool yeah i'm googling it now it doesn't look like they have it anymore but uh beyond hogwarts.com does as well as uh the hp lexicon (laughs) i don't know how they get these conversions but good work (laughs) probably just make it up (laughs) yeah i think uh there there's a good long history of uh interviews of people asking how much a galleon (laughs) Uh, costs and so. J.K. Rowling just pulls a random number out of her head. <laughs> oh yeah, she's like, oh, it's like five I mean, quid she or whatever. You know, <laughs> I mean, this is crazy. On the lexicon, you can convert from any currency in the world. <laughs> like, <what? laughs> come on, that's not come on. Uh, man, I love it. Well, you know, if you type in the cost of uh, apparition lessons in Brazilian currency, uh, you get the release date for the next Fantastic Pieces film. <laughs> a nice little easter egg <laughs> don't give anybody any ideas oh yeah, yeah sure sure all right well, what's this week's question <laughs> this the... week's question what is the name of the celebrity apparition instructor mike had talked about um but uh yeah that's that's it just a, an easy one next week you should have asked what's the currency from south korean <laughs> to galleon for extra points you could convert your student loan debt into galleons <laughs> Let us know what that is. oh my god that's the next uh we're gonna create that on hypable that's gonna be a hypable exclusive tool oh my god <laughs> just in time for tax season oh, don't remind <laughs> how about that? me a tax can conver- how, how many galleons do you owe to the irs <laughs> Oh, no. If you would like to contact us about anything we discussed today, just hit up MuggleCast.com. We have a contact link right at the top. You can also just email us, MuggleCast at gmail.com, or call us, one nine two zero three muggle That's one nine two zero three six eight four four five three. You can also mail us the old-fashioned way with pen and paper. 
Our P.O. Box is 4044 North Lincoln Avenue, Box 144, Chicago, Illinois, 60618. Just address it to MuggleCast. We are going to record a bonus MuggleCast in just a moment. That'll be available at patreon.com slash MuggleCast. We release two pieces of bonus audio per month in case you want more. And it's a way to say thank you to those of you who support us. We have lots of benefits in the works for the new year. We're excited to solidify those and announce them. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm Micah. And I'm Laura. We'll see you in two weeks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.